Jean van Leeuwen, Chair of the SADA Scientific Advisory Committee, we'd like to invite you to the SADA National Conference to be held in Cape Town from the 25th to the 27th of August. Streamlined are the three full days. This year's program features more podium speakers, more lecture time, and more trader interaction. See you in Cape Town this August. I'm Dr. Jean van Leeuwen, Chair of the SADA Scientific Advisory Committee. We'd like to invite you to the SADA National Conference to be held in Cape Town from the 25th to the 27th of August. Streamlined are the three full days. This year's program features more podium speakers, more lecture time, and more trader interaction. See you in Cape Town this August. Good evening. Welcome to this webinar for the YDC, part of the YDC webinar series. This is the web, fourth webinar in a series of six. I'd like to welcome each one of you and thank you for attending. We're just going to give it a few more minutes for all those who have registered to attend. But as you have seen, we are looking forward to hosting all of you at the South African Dental, Dental Congress and Trade Exhibition in Cape Town later this year. The registrations are climbing rapidly and we urge each and every one of you to jo come join us and share network and be a part of the experience. I see the numbers are getting up. Um, I'm going to take some time just to mention a bit of the house rules as soon as we have sufficient attendees as per normal. Please refrain from using the raised hand, but type your comments and questions in the Q&A tab. Wow. CPD certificates will be loaded onto the HPCSA and SADA platform, and you will be able to access all your certificates under your member profile. This evening's um, ethical, this evening's, this evening's event qualifies for one ethical CEU. Right. I think our numbers are still rising and we are in the presence of very esteemed guests. I will take a few minutes to just introduce them, some of which you are very familiar with. And for those who know, these can be your best friends. So I would make sure that you listen to them, especially in your times of need. First up, we have Dr. Alasdair McAlvey. He's the head of Dental Services South Africa, Dental Protection, graduated from Dundee Dental School in the UK in 1984, remaining in the hospital environment for 12 months as a house officer gaining experience in restorative dentistry. He then worked for 23 years in general dental practice, first as an associate before opening his own private practice in which he worked until the practice was sold in 2008. LSD's association with the dental protection began with him working as a local dental advisor in 2000 before becoming an associate dental legal advisor in 2003. In 2007, LSD graduated from the University of Wales with an LLM in healthcare law. Alistair became a full-time member of the advisory staff in 2008 and is currently a senior dental legal advisor and head of dental services in Southern Africa. Next up, we have Dr. Yesh Naidu, who's a case manager at Medical Protection Society. Dr. Yesh Naidu is a case manager at MPS South Africa. He is former healthcare and disp dispute resolution attorney at two of South Africa's so-called big five law firms. His legal, experience, his legal experience includes assisting private and public healthcare institutions in defending medical malpractice claims, assisting healthcare practitioners and institutions with proceedings before their regulators, that being the HPCSA, AHPCSA, SAPC, and OHSC, advising clients in respect of South African healthcare regulations and assisting foreign qualified medical practitioners in obtaining registration with the HPCSA. Prior to starting his legal career, Yash qualified and practiced as a dentist. While practicing dentistry full-time in the public sector, he obtained his LLB from the University of South Africa, Cum Laude. He joined MPS in August 2020. And next up, we have Dr. Jacobus Bernard, who is the dental mediator for the South African Dental Association. 
Dr. Barnard is the dental mediator at the South African Dental Association. He qualified at the University of Pretoria in 1999 and holds a membership of the Royal College of Surgeons in the UK. He has also been part of risk prevention education faculty at Dent Protection since 2010. He practices dentistry in the Southern Cape with special interest in implantology and conscious sedation. He is a SAMLA accredited medical negligence mediator, medical legal practitioner, and expert witness. So those are the um, panelists for today. I'm gonna now hand over to Dr. Alasda McKelvey to just run through how today's proceedings will perform. Thank you, Alasda. Thank you, Dr. Osman. Good evening, um, friends and colleagues. When, when Marilee's first asked Dent Protection if we'd like to participate in the mentorship week, um, my, my first sort of immediate thought was this is probably not for us only because the program looked as though uh, it was focusing more on the business side of dentistry, uh, medical aids, making more profit out of your business. Uh, and, and, and some of the business related challenges that you guys face every day and every week and every year of practice. Now, at Dental Protection, we, we specialize in protecting dentists and one of our purposes is to protect them from financial loss and sometimes that can create uh, a misunderstanding that that we're, we're we're there to pick up some of the business issues, but when I thought more clearly at this, um, I thought, well, maybe we could participate in the mentorship week, and we could participate by talking about complaints, how to avoid them, and if you can't avoid them, how you can handle them more efficiently, so you can free up time for more profitable work or to spend time with your friends and your families and not really to to, to also mention the the sort of human cost of less stress and emotion um, by avoiding complaints in the first place so that's really the angle that we're coming from and that's why i've invited um two of my colleagues and good friends dr yash naidu and dr kobus barnard to join us this evening and the plan really is just to chat through a number of things that we know about complaints we've got vast experience of of, of helping professional colleagues handle and manage complaints both uh, at a practice level and with the HPCSA so I'm really pleased that we're able to join you tonight and I'm delighted that I've got Yash and Kobus here to help uh, answer some of the questions and if there are any questions that um, come to your minds, please type them into the, the Q&A function. And if we can pick them up while we're, we're going through the next hour or so, then great. If not, we'll try and leave five or 10 minutes to pick up the questions at the end. So um, good evening, Ash. Good evening, Cobus. Um, maybe you just want to say a quick hello before we get down to the nitty gritty. Yeah, evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here with you. Thanks, Alistair and Nadim. Good evening, everyone, friends, colleagues. Um, Alistair, thank you very much for inviting me and Yash tonight to join the YDC um, event tonight. And I really look forward to spend the next hour and, and have a bit of a chat about important things. Okay, guys, thank you. Um, Kobus, I'm gonna get you into, into action fairly quickly here because we wanna talk about complaints at the dental practice level. So patients who are unhappy with something that's happened at, at the dental practice, and we call that kind of local resolution rather than the resolution of a complaint at the HPCSA. So to set the scene, not everyone will understand that you are the SADA dental mediator. Can you tell us a little bit about the work you do for for SADA and the work that you do for the wider profession and, and, and for the citizens of South Africa and helping them manage complaints with dentists and other oral healthcare practitioners. Yes, thank you, Alastair. Yeah, so SADA introduced a complaint resolution service to uh, their members, the dentists, but also to members of the public in, 2000, in 2012. Um, it's a free service. Um, it's a voluntary service, 
And the aim of the service is really to resolve complaints quickly, uh, fairly, through good communication and try and prevent uh, third parties getting involved, like the HPCSA or lawyers. Um, and we've been doing that very efficiently. And uh, looking back over the last, say, 12 years, I think we've managed to successfully re resolve close to 5,000 complaints. Um, Yes, yeah, so that's what we do. So when a patient, Alistair, you mentioned patients not being happy with their treatment, and that's a reality of being a professional person, whether you're an experienced dentist, a specialist, or a newly qualified dentist, you will inevitably end up with one or two patients that are unhappy with the way you treated them or how much they paid for their treatment. And then those patients only have a few different options. Uh, one of them is to contact the HPCSA, which uh, Dr. Naidu is going to talk about a little bit later. But the only other free alternative to the HPCSA is contacting SADA. Um, and this is the reason why the service was established in 2012 to try and intercept or create a valuable alternative for patients to lodge their complaint to. So, Kobus, who who can contact you? Can can if a dentist is aware that a patient is unhappy about something that's happened at the practice, what would you suggest that they do first? Would you suggest they pick up the phone and contact you, or would you suggest that they try and speak to the patient, invite the patient in? Um, to have a meeting at the practice and try and understand what what the issues are before they look to a resolution. So, Alistair, most of the complaints that I work with, most of the work that I do, and I'm sure most of the work that the HPCSA do, could have been handled by the practice um, through a local resolution uh, service and it's only because these patients were dismissed or ignored at the practice that they try and then contact a third party to help them and the only two options the only two free options that are available is the HPCSA or SADA so it's a bit of a roll of the dice uh, who they're going to contact SADA or the HPCSA but dentists often also contact me for help with resolving a complaint, mostly those who don't have indemnity or who is not a member of dental protection. And then, of course, uh, you can help those dentists, but um, you have to ask the dentist to refer the patient to the SADA Complaints Resolution Service because of patient confidentiality and the Poppy Act. I, I am not allowed to contact the patient directly without the patient's permission. So a dentist would then uh, recommend that the patient contact the SADA Complaint Resolution Service and provide my details. And those patients would then contact me um, if they think it's a good idea. Can you, can you tell me or tell the audience tonight how how patients react when they first contact you? Are, are they angry? Are they upset? Are they relieved that somebody's there to listen to their story? I mean, what sort of things do they tell you um, about their complaint that, that, that surprise you? Yeah, so it took me a while to get used to it, but, but some patients just shout in your ear for about half an hour. And, and you just have to listen and say, yes, yes, I understand and, and provide empathy. And, and sometimes you think it's never going to stop the shouting, but eventually it stops. And by the end of the, the, the phone conversation, the patient is not even interested in, in lodging the complaint anymore. All they wanted is somebody to listen to their issues, to validate their complaint and to explain uh, the options that they have going forward and uh, so yes Alistair most of the patients just want have this need for someone to listen to what they've been going through and and uh, just provide a bit of empathy and when someone do that they sometimes just decide not to take the complaint further. <laughs> do, do, do they ever express any reluctance to discuss a complaint with you because you are another dentist do they see you as did they see you as being 
neutral, impartial, or do they see you as being a friend of the dentist rather than a friend of the patient? Or, or does that not happen? No, it doesn't happen. The majority of patients, uh, it gives you credibility being a dentist with 25 years experience, you know, because you know exactly what the complaint is about. It gives you insight into the situation. Um, yeah, so no, I don't have that problem at all with patients not trusting the service or the independency of the service. Okay, I'm going to bring Yash in here because you know, your, your, your specialist subject tonight, Yash, is going to be the HPCSA, but you've handled plenty of complaints from, from, from the, the, that have been received by doctors and dentists during your time before you came to MPS, but also in your time at MPS. Can you, can you maybe talk a little bit about what we do for our members who contact us and say, They've got a complaint from the telephone call to the case file. Yeah, sure, Alistair. I mean, before I get there, let me just put this into context a bit when it comes to complaints and things, right? So I know uh, Dr. Osman was reading out our introductions, um, which uh, I don't know who drafted those long introductions. I'm, I'm kidding, it was us. <laughs> but I mean, I used to be a young dentist, right? In the public service. And before, before long, I became a lawyer, right? And all I would do in my legal career was help doctors, dentists, health professionals when they, um, when they get sued most, most often. Quite a bit also when there's complaints, but more when they get sued. And in my mind, I would always think that these lawsuits and these claims of millions and sometimes 30, 40 million rand for the obstetricians were the most important be all and end all thing in, in a practitioner's career, right? And then I joined the MPS South Africa services in, 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 what was it, 2020. And when we join, we have to go into an induction because, you know, MPS is based in the UK and dental protection is based in the UK. And in, as part of that in, induction process, one of the most eye-opening things that was told to me and that I've since learned after joining is that dental protection, medical protection, for them, the more important thing for practitioners is not the claims of millions when patients take you to court, because that you're most likely indemnified, you're a member of some indemnity organization, be it dental protection or anybody else. That can be dealt with. You, know, you can go to court, get lawyers, even if you're found guilty, you pay money and it's over, right? We, you will carry on practicing. But when it comes to these complaints at the regulator, at the HPCSA, this can be a matter of a difference between you practicing forever or your career coming to an end, right? So just to put these complaints in context and don't be like me, learn from what I've learned and that these are actually probably more important than those claims when you get a summons or when a sheriff comes knocking. So to go back to your question, Alistair, what, what happens is, right, I sit here, if I work from home on some days, and some days I'm in the office in Pretoria, and we'll get doctors and dentists that, have, that will dial in and speak to us and say, I've got an issue, I've got this complaint, a patient, I'm just gonna pick a random example, is complaining that I'm not disclosing their records to them. And, uh, you know, I don't want to give them the records, they must pay me or they must come here or something like that. And what we do is we then try using our experience and, you know, our knowledge of the regulations and the rules and sometimes not even that, sometimes just practicalities. We try as best as possible to help medical protection and dental protection members who are the doctors and dentists to deal with the issues. And I love my job because on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm dealing with this kind of thing. For the last year, I've, I've helped doctors and dentists with hundreds of, of complaints, be they at the HPCSA or the so-called informal or direct complaints that Corbis uh, probably deals with more often. And so that in a nutshell is, is what I do at, at, in my job. And I love it, yeah. Okay, thanks, Yash. Uh, <clears throat> and I, I, I guess that I could probably say a little bit about what I do as well, because 
I still, my team in the in the UK in the Leeds office, we still handle the majority of the cases arising out of our South African dental membership. And, you know, it's, it's quite common that a member of dental protection will contact dental protection seeking assistance with a complaint that is currently being mediated with by Dr. Barnard. Now, I think it, Cobus, it's important that the guys on the call understand there is a separation here between what you do and what we do. Because because you're the guy in the middle, you've got you've got a patient and you've got a dentist and you're trying to negotiate an agreement that meets everybody's expectations. Okay, now sometimes the solution might involve just an apology. And I want to talk about apologies in a minute and the power of saying I'm sorry and what it means and what it doesn't mean. But I think first first of all, um, I, the, some problems are solved by paying a, paying a refund or paying for the next course of dental treatment, which has only become necessary because of some error or mistake by the dentist who's in the negotiation. Now, it, it, if if there's any uncertainty in the minds of the dentist who you're you're mediating with will be clear is that your your job is to say to them, look, if you're not sure about your position, contact your indemnifier. And I know that's what you do, but I don't work with you and you don't work with me to find the solution. I help, Yash and I help the dentist understand their own position and what's at stake for them. And if they've caused the need for remedial treatment, then we can look to see how we can support them financially. But we're not involved in the negotiating. I don't contact you. Yash doesn't contact you. We're not involved in that process. We are separately advising our member on how they might approach a mediation. Is that what normally happens? Yes, thanks, Alistair. Yeah, so that's one of the first questions I would ask a dentist if if the dentist um, contacts me about a complaint or if I contact the dentist about a complaint is if he or she is a member of, of a indemnity organization like uh, dental protection or ethical or PPS or whatever. And I guess it's the same when complaints go to the HPCSA. The HPCSA still handles the complaint, but with the back, but the dentist have the backup and, so, and the support of his indemnifier. And it's the same when complaints gets resolved through the SADA mediation service. The, the mediation service is completely separate to dental protection. The dentist just have the advantage of participating in this voluntary mediation process with experts and the backup support of dental protection. It's almost like playing against the All Blacks on your own, where uh, if you don't have indemnity, but when you have indemnity, you still play against the All Blacks, but you have 14 people supporting you um, playing against the All Blacks. So yeah, so dentists participate in this voluntary mediation process, which aims to find a resolution that's fair and that's acceptable by both parties but the dentists have the, the, the advice and, and the expertise of, of how many years of complaints, dental protections experience, 10 or so, so much years. So, um, yeah, so yeah, that's so, how it generally works. So, I, so, so the bottom line here is if, if you get a call from Dr. Barnard or you're aware there is a complaint, there's no reason why you shouldn't contact us and say, look, I've just become aware there is a problem here with this patient. What do you think I should be doing? And we, we, will, we, we will advise our individual member on his position, not on how to negotiate what necessarily to say, but we will say, look, you may have a vulnerability here and that may influence the strategy that you agree when you go into the mediation process. And, it, and, and if, in that mediation process, there is something that 
the dentist is asked to do by the patient or the patient makes a request for some sort of financial contribution, then it's possible for everybody to press pause on the mediation process and, and then allow the dentist to, to obtain professional advice from their indemnifier or insurer before they continue with the mediation. Is that how, how you best see it working, Corbus? Yep. So w whenever there's um, any correspondence from the patient about a possible outcome, look, successful mediation is really trying to get behind the, the needs, the concerns and the expectations of the patient. And sometimes those expectations are not realistic and a, and a voluntary mediation process will never be the answer to to unrealistic expectations and that's where your indemnifier comes in is to help and to help and advise you whether those expectations are realistic uh, considering your vulnerabilities in that case looking at the records and your x-rays and your con consent process then uh, um, yeah so it's really uh, where your indemnifier comes in is negotiating almost on your behalf in the background uh, knowing what's in the records and what sort of support they have behind uh, supporting your case. Okay. I just want to move the conversation on to the power of an apology. Okay. And I maybe go to Yash first because you've got the, the, the mindset of an, of an attorney, of a legal advisor, and people are always very worried to make admissions and, and they worry about saying sorry because almost immediately patients will attach significance to the words, I'm sorry, um, this wasn't meant to happen. But is there any reassurance you could give us about, about defusing a situation with an apology? Because the, the word sorry is very powerful and emotive and, and it tends to take the, the initial heat out of most situations. And um, it's probably fair to say that patients are not necessarily expecting an apology yeah so so alistair i don't know whether to take it as a compliment or an insult when you say i've got the mindset of an attorney <laughs> but, but 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 i know what you're saying um look there, there's this myth in south africa i don't know whether it's all over the world in all jurisdictions but there's this myth that by saying sorry you're admitting fault and negligence and liability and automatically once you've said sorry you know the patient's got you it's a smoking gun and you know what, to be honest, it might have been perpetuated and started by lawyers, old school lawyers, uh, very conservative mindset. I don't know, I, I'm speculating, but the reality is that sorry is something that you can say if you've done something wrong. And if you're genuinely remorseful about something that's happened, you know, I can be sorry for something that I've not done at all. You know, somebody else, when, when, when we have friends who, who have, loved ones who pass away we say we're sorry for your loss condolences we're not saying that we caused the loss so similarly it's very important it's a very important tool but it needs to be authentic and genuine because patients can tell when you're just saying sorry to fob them off or they can see when you genuinely have some sort of remorse and regret what happened and and there's no harm in saying sorry so one of my uh, goals is to dispel that, dispel that myth that saying sorry um, will get you in trouble. I mean, you know, sometimes it might, you know, it's always best to ask your, you know, your, your defense organization or a senior colleague or somebody um, if you're not sure, but there's no harm in saying sorry. I, I don't think I'd ever criticize a member for saying to a patient, look, I'm really sorry about this. I'm sorry you're unhappy. Sorry you're so unhappy or I'm sorry this wasn't the outcome I expected. You know, we can fix all these problems and, and it's not an admission of wrongdoing. It's, it's an expression of regret. And most courts around, most lawmakers around the world are now um, creating some sort of protection about around apologies, particularly in healthcare, because it's such an emotional business. I mean, it's, you know, I'm, I'm sorry I bumped into your car is not quite as big a problem as I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I've caused a permanent paresthesia putting this implant in. I mean, I, it, it, it's apologies around healthcare and the emotion of it are really, really, are, 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 are really, really sensible. It's just a great way 
of approaching because genuinely we probably all are as practitioners full of regret when things don't go as, as well as they should and we should never be afraid to say I'm, I'm sorry. And, and Cobus, I bet that's part of what you hear from the patients who contact you. They say the, the dentist is never, the dentist at their practice, they never even said they're sorry about this. Yes, Alistair, yes. It's like Yash said, you know, there's this myth that throwing money at any problem will make it go away, but it is not the case with patient complaints. You know, a lot of them want validation of their complaint. They want you, someone to acknowledge that what happened to them is not normal and shouldn't happen to another patient. So they want, first of all, some acknowledgement, and then they want to make sure that the same thing doesn't happen to uh, the next patient. Um, so it's, they want some, uh, yeah, someone to make sure that the necessary steps are taken to to make sure it doesn't happen to the next patient. But uh, for me, you know, we talked about an apology, but for me, it, it's a lot about empathy as well. Patients want want them want you to acknowledge what they're going through. You know, the the their journey. Uh, when things started going wrong, the journey through the remedial treatment, all the additional costs that they incur, they want somebody to acknowledge that and understand that. And uh, so for me, empathy is, is also a, a more powerful tool than, than an apology, you know. I think the, the, the other thing I want to ask you, Corbus, is that the, 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 there are patients who make a career out of being professional complainers okay so not not every complaint is genuine and not every complaint is made because a, a patient's had um a, a poor outcome so i, I mean i it, it, we've got to balance this up is that, that that not every complaint is justified and i and i think you know you can probably weed out quite a few of those when they come through to you directly from the patient first time up yes alistair because it's a free service it doesn't cost the patient anything to contact sada you get a lot of unnecessary stuff and my 25 years experience as a dentist helps me understand uh, these cases and like I said a free voluntary mediation process is not the answer to every complaint especially when those expectations are unrealistic or when patients take a chance I mean what we see a lot at SADA is that patients complain because of the quality of the treatment, be simply because they cannot afford the outstanding amount. So what would typically happen is uh, the dentist would send reminders at 30, 60, 90 days, and the moment he hands over that account to the debt collector, the patient will lodge a complaint to SADA or the HPCSA because suddenly now the treatment has never been right. You know, the crown is not the right color, the tooth is still painful, uh, the food still collects between those teeth. Uh, so they try and find fault with the clinical treatment simply because they, they can't afford to pay the, the bill. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I've always said this is a great idea to before you hand over a debt for collection is to make sure that as the clinician you contact the patient you don't delegate this to anybody else you contact the patient and say look this account's been outstanding for how many weeks or months uh, and before I hand it over for collection I've got no idea why you haven't paid this but you know this is your opportunity to tell me why the account remains unpaid and and you give the patient the opportunity to tell you there and then before you hand it over once if you've given them the opportunity before they hand it over and they say nothing then the the the, the moral high ground shifts to the dentist so if if there is an outstanding account then i i always suggest that and it's not something that necessarily should be delegated but you just contact the patient and you say look um this account's not not been paid despite one or two reminders why is that is there something about the treatment that you need to tell me before i hand it over for collection yep and of course write that that down in the records as well so that if there's a dispute in a couple of months time so that you have that written down in your records okay so i'm looking at i'm i'm looking across as uh and I'm, and there's no point asking me because i was it's too many years since i was at dental school but is 
our, our young dentists in South Africa graduating from dental school with any real insight into how to manage patients who suddenly become unhappy with their treatment? Is there any undergraduate training in complaints handling? And I guess this is more to you, Yash, because you're the one that's closest to um, having been at dental school. But I reckon the, the answer is, well, they don't have enough time to, to do the practical clinical stuff, never mind give us practical clinical advice on complaints management. That would have been my answer if you asked me when I was still in dental school about 15 years ago. I think it's improving and I think it's it's changed recently because people have, or, or academic institutions have realized the importance of, you know, practice management and complaint management. But I wouldn't be giving you an informed answer, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. So, so Corbis, if, you know, we've, we've all helped dentists resolve complaints and sometimes we've not helped them resolve complaints. Sometimes it's impossible to resolve some complaints, but if, if we really wanted to get it right at the level of our practice, can you tell me a little bit about this whole concept of a complaints procedure and, and what that actually looks like when it works well? Yes, yes, of course, Alistair. So I just want to come back to your first, to your previous question to Yash about the university training. You know, they, there was a study published in, in the SADJ in 2019 that looked at the um, complaints against oral health care practitioners lodged to the HPCSA in, in a 10 year period, which ended up to be close to 28,000 complaints. And um, in that, of those 28,000 complaints, uh, only 22.8%, if I remember correctly, were related to clinical issues. And the rest, the 77.8%, were non-clinical issues, which is issues with unprofessionalism, financial consent, um, which tells me that the clinical treatment at university is maybe still up to standard, but where the training is lacking is communication and complaint resolution stuff. And I talked a little bit earlier about the only two free options for a patient to complain is, is either SADA or the HPCSA. So for me, it's important to create a path of very little resistance at your practice, which also, which is a free, efficient, uh, way of dealing with complaints. And that's through a practice complaints procedure, which every practice should have one. Patients that want to complain about anything should know exactly how to do it, who to contact, because if they don't know how to do it, they, con they will contact SADA or the HPCCA. So ideally at your practice, uh, you should have one person that's responsible for, for dealing with all unhappy patients and it can be an experienced dentist with good communication skills or a practice manager or uh, one of the hygienists or um, a person with uh, an experienced person with good communication skills who deals with every unhappy patient in your practice then ideally you should have a log where you log every single complaint uh, from a patient whether the receptionist thinks the 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 complaint have merit or not. It needs to be written down so that it can be responded to. A lot of the complaints end up with the HPCSA without the dentist even being aware of the complaint. And the first time he becomes aware is when he receives the dreaded email from uh, Dr. Quinda and his team at the HPCSA. Um, because the practice manager might think that the uh, complaint have no merit or they want to try and protect the dentist from ad unnecessary administration and in the end uh, although they meant well the complaint escalates to the HPCSA which highlights the need of a of a practice uh, you know a register where you write down the details of of every complaint and then you should also write down every step taken to, to try and resolve the complaint. You know, referrals made, emails sent, uh, phone calls made. Um, and that's what a typical practice complaints procedure should look like. You know, the, the patient should always know what's going to happen next and how long will it take and what to expect. Um, 
through a practice compliance procedure. And you know, we as dentists uh, that are members of SARA and Dental Protection have the advantage of, of uh, phoning a friend, <laughs> like in, who, who wants to be a millionaire. You know, when you don't, when you don't know what to, what to do next, phone a friend. Uh, there's some good friends at SARA and, and at Dental Protection that can help you. Um, yeah, so that's, if every practice have a practice complaints procedure, I think the HPC is I will be out of work. So, so, so Corpus, is there any evidence to suggest that the people who run the complaints procedure or have a complaints procedure actually attract more complaints than the practices who don't have a complaints procedure? Because, because it, it, half of my mind is saying, why would I want to advertise the fact that, that, that there's somewhere for you to complain? It gives patients the idea that, that complaints are welcome, but they are actually welcome, aren't they? Yes, you know, I don't see the complaints from practices with practice complaints procedures. I see only the complaints from practices without practice complaints procedures because, um, you know, as dentists, we can use those complaints as, as positive criticism to improve the way we provide our services. and and. Receiving complaints give you a, a valuable opportunity to improve the service that you offer and make sure the same thing doesn't happen again. And if, if dentists can only see it that way, then, then they will have a much more prosperous career, I think, with less complaint. Okay. I mean, yeah, I would agree with you. And I, and I guess that the other thing that a lot of folks don't realize, Yash, and this, and we're going to come on to the HPCSA right now about what happens when a complaint's made to the HPCSA, but there are actually is a professional ethical um, rule or guideline that the HPCSA set out that um, all practitioners are required to handle complaints. You know, there, are, there, there, are, there is an ethical rule set that says you can't ignore a complaint if you if you don't if you don't fancy dealing with it there is a professional obligation to handle all complaints efficiently and quickly and promptly and and fairly as well yeah 100 percent. there's a guideline that says that you should deal in good faith with your patients and try and resolve it you know um Corbis, what Corbis is speaking about you know it really makes so much sense to me you know when he mentioned that that study that sadj study from 2019 i hadn't seen it but Anecdotally, um, I can tell you that the vast majority of the complaints that I see that go to the HPCSA are never going to be taken, uh, you know, clinical because, and especially when it's dentistry uh, patients, right? Because they don't know whether your crown prep was off or not, whether your class two was correct. All they know is what they're dealing with at face value and the soft skills and the experience that they're getting from the dentist. And um, if you give them an opportunity to complain, it's a good thing because then at least you're giving yourself an, op an opportunity to, to improve your service, firstly, and secondly, avoid that um, creating, you know, making the patient have no choice but to go to the HPCSA because they will then Google it and come across it very quickly and easily. Okay, so we're going to go straight to the HPCSA process and I'm going to get you to walk us through what happens when the patient presses send on their laptop and they send in that complaint and and at some point i want us to stop okay just press the pause button and just very quickly talk about how difficult it is for a professional person to be criticized to a third party and how sometimes well probably not just sometimes how most of the time where the dentist who is the subject of the complaint is not the best person to write the explanation. So, you know, we, we, we're not great at accepting criticism, particularly from our patients, particularly from those who we probably least expect the complaint to come from. So we'll talk about the emotion of the complaint and, and, and objectivity and subjectivity, but just briefly talk us through what happens when that complaint arrives at the HPCSA in the inbox about how, how they triage where it might go and, and the two different pathways. Yeah, no problem. So patient goes onto the HPCSA's website, downloads the complaint form, 
And that form has details about the complainant, it has details about the dentist, and then there's a, a box which says, what is your complaint? Another box later on which says, what do you expect as an outcome? And going back to what Corbus was talking about earlier, you'll be surprised how many of them just say, I want an apology, or I want to make sure that this doesn't happen to another patient. You know, so we've always got this, this misconception that patients are out there to get money from us. A lot of them just want an apology and attention. So anyway, they'll write it, they'll fill in that form and send it to the HPCSA. And what the HPCSA then does is it goes to the office of the registrar and the registrar needs to do a sort of triaging process where they'll look at the complaint and they'll say, okay, is this a billing complaint or something minor? Like, you know, the, 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 the dentist refused to give me copies of my records. I want them tomorrow or else. That will be categorized as a minor complaint, okay? If it's a serious complaint, like, you know, this, patient, this, this dentist was, you know, abusive towards me or has done something that's more than just a simple complaint about billing, you know, then it, it's no longer categorized as a minor complaint. So it can either be a minor or, a not, or not a minor complaint. I don't want to say severe because anything that's not minor will go into the second category. So if it's a minor complaint, what will then happen is the registrar will refer it to, I'm gonna use an old term, it's a, it's a two week old term, the office of the ombudsman, right? At the HPCSA, who is now no longer called the ombudsman, they're called the chief mediator, right? So what happens is they want to try and resolve these minor complaints as quickly and as efficiently and amicably as possible. So they give it to the chief mediator slash ombudsman, and they will, that ombudsman or the chief mediator will write to you as the dentist and say, dear uh, Dr. Barnard, you've got a complaint from patient X. Because it's a minor complaint, we're dealing with it via the mediation process. Please, can you uh, have a look at the complaint and, and let us know uh, what your view is? And I say that, and they give them 10 days to respond, right? And what's supposed to happen is the chief mediator is then supposed to gather information from Dr. Barnard I'm the complainant or the patient, try and get together and resolve it. Because, you know, nobody wins if a complaint drags out for weeks and months and years, right? That's the first pathway. The second pathway is if it's not a minor complaint, it won't go to the office of the chief mediator or the ombudsman, but it will go to the preliminary committee of inquiry and they will write to you and say, Dr. Barnard, you've received this complaint from patient X. They'll name the patient and they'll attach the complaint and they'll say, you've got 40 days to provide a formal written explanation. Now, please, will you let us have your explanation for consideration? And I don't know if you want to pause there, Alistair, or you want me to carry on? I, I, yeah. I just wanted you to, to, to just talk briefly about, um, we'll, we'll come back to the emotional side of it, okay, because because that's important because th there is some work that MPS has done around the emotional side of being involved with the HPCSA and the stress that it causes. But the, there's a couple of really important things that I think we need to talk about here because the letter that the registrant receives from the HPCSA says, um, suggests it's probably a good idea if you contact your indemnifier. Now, we we would expect all members of Dent Protection and MPS to contact us if they have correspondence from the HPC, HPCSA, either from the chief mediator or in relation to a written explanation that's required by the committee of preliminary inquiry so it's important that you don't handle these things on your on, on your own and that's partly what you have indemnity for the indemnity is there for to protect insulate you from the the consequences of a successful claim for compensation but it's also to pay uh, the legal fees attached and having proper representation before the hpcsa even if it's just written representation for the Committee of Preliminary Inquiry. What I wanted to know, Yash, was, we, 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 and I may have jumped ahead here, and you were going to talk about this anyway, but when a complaint is received by the HPCSA, is, 
Is there an investigating team that can come round unannounced to your practice and carry out an inspection as part of their investigation of the complaint? That's a very good point. I'm glad you reminded me of that because there is, and that's another process altogether, right? So sometimes there'll be a complaint from a member of the public, from maybe your competitor, somebody who doesn't like you, and they'll say something like, and I'm just going to use a real life example. Um, this practitioner is issuing fake sick notes, right? Now, in those types of situations, the HPCSA is empowered to institute an investigation process, right? And it's called Section 41A investigation, where they can get appoint an investigator, give them this complaint, and allow them to rock up at your practice or wherever you're working relatively unannounced for an investigation. Because, you know, clearly that kind of situation, you wouldn't want to necessarily notify the practitioner ahead of time because you want to go there and see what's happening yourself. And, and that, that also happens and that can happen, yeah. Can you, I mean, how, first of all, I mean, can you say if, if there's somebody at the door from the HPCSA, I mean, surely they've got to prove who they are and, and why they've turned up because we, the, the dentist at that point may not know there's an investigation going on. Is that possible? Yeah, that's very possible. They might not know about it at all. Um, what's supposed to happen? Yeah, no, go on, Alistair. You was- and so, so they arrive unannounced. You don't really know what it's about. Can you refuse them access or tell them, no, sorry, I'm not letting you in? Do they have a can- power? Do they have a power to come into your business? You can. So, so the first thing is they need to identify themselves, right? And not just simply say, here's, you know, this is my name. I'm from the HPCSA. Here's my business card. They're supposed to have a certificate of appointment, this investigator. And it's a very formal document. And, and I cannot expect a dentist in practice to know whether something's legit or not, yeah. because we've seen fraudsters posing as investigators. And I think MPS, medical protection on the medical side, has even sent out a note to their members to say, watch out, there are some people who are posing as fraudsters. So the position that that a lot of the lawyers that do work for MPS and dental protection says, Tell them to, to hold on. I want to contact my indemnity organization slash lawyer and they will get in touch with you and then I'll, I'll carry on um, and cooperate if necessary. But technically speaking, the rules allow them to come there. They must come with a search warrant that's granted by a magistrate. And depending on what that warrant empowers them to do, they can either come with a person from the South African police service or they can come alone and you'll have to look and see what the warrant says and, and cooperate, you know? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad we've cleared that up because for me, that was an important point because I see that happening when the cases are reported to us and we're, we're asked to assist. Um, just tell me a little bit about what the preliminary commit, the committee of preliminary inquiry do with your explanation. So they meet every few months. And they don't only just consider your explanation, they consider lots of different complaints and lots of different explanations in respect of various practitioners. And they look at your explanation. Well, firstly, they'll read the complaint. They'll look at your explanation and they'll make a decision, right? They can make one of, I think, four or five decisions. They can say, okay, we're happy with Dr. Barnard's explanation, all good. Uh, No evidence of unprofessional conduct. Closing the matter, we'll let the complainant know. Right. Then they can say, on the other hand, they can say, look, we're not sure. We don't have enough information here. Let's call Dr. Barnard to a meeting and um, let's all sit around the table and ask him some questions. And that's when, you know, I feel for the practitioners because it's an intimidating thing. You know, going and meeting with peers of yours who, you know, are just judging every little thing that you've done with one single case. And it might not have been the, the, the best example case of your career that you want to, you know, you want your peers to see. So that's an intimidating thing. The other thing is they can say, look, Dr. Barnard was unprofessional in this case, but it was a minor transgression. So we'll just give him a warning or we'll give him a small little fine, slap on the wrist, something like that. Another thing they can do is they can say, well, look, this is clearly unprofessional conduct here. We've got to send Dr. Barnard now for a formal um, professional conduct inquiry. Um, and so that, those are the, some of the, the options that can come out, yeah. Okay. Um, 
before we, we before we go in a slightly different direction, I I just want to to get us all to have a think about the emotion of being involved with an HPCSA investigation. And Gobus, I, I would imagine a lot in a in a in many of the complaints that you deal with, where you're contacting a dentist, that they, some of them are expecting the phone call, some of them are not expecting the phone call. Some people are very, very defensive, but some people are also very anxious about it. And 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 do do you do you find it quite common that there's a lot of subject subjectivity and emotion? attached to the response from the dentist rather than clear objective thinking? Look, it is, it is a very stressful experience to receive a negative feedback from a patient or, or a complaint. I know there's many studies done, uh, especially in the UK, there was one study done on doctors uh, um, working in the, in the NHS and uh, they looked at 8,000 doctors who received complaints and they found that 27% of them suffered from anxiety. There was a number of them that suffered from depression. The 80% of them were practicing defensive medicine as a result of the complaint which is of course recommending or performing a procedure that's not in the interest of the patient, but just clearly to protect yourself. Um, and the stress in these studies were definitely the highest when the regulator was involved, which in, in our case is the HPCSA. You know, these dentists panic, uh, they panic about their future, they panic about uh, their, their practice, you know, their reputation. Um, and it's normal, you know, to, to panic about those things because it's not as if we go to work wanting to harm our patients or disappoint our patients. We all want to run prosperous, successful practices with patients that love us. Um, so it, it, there's a lot of emotion involved. And the studies also show that dentists with an existing complaint have a higher risk of receiving a second complaint because you really don't, uh, you really struggle to concentrate at work, you know, it consumes your thoughts, it takes away your confidence, um, and it really increases your risk of receiving another complaint. Okay, so, so whenever a member contacts Dental Protection asking for some help with a complaint, whether it's just uh, a simple billing issue or something more complex of the type that the HPCSA would be interested in, we, we, will, we will always um, assist a member by providing objective legal support and representation. And um, Yash, you, you, you've been doing this for many, many years, and, and there's a very good reason why um, we get our attorneys involved in South Africa and assisting our members. Maybe you can just explain why we do that. Yeah, and it's important when you say our attorneys, because you know, it's it's not every attorney that's going to deal with it as sensitively and appropriately as as this kind of forum requires. You know, the purpose of us at Dental Protection and the attorneys who are experienced in this kind of work is not to complicate things. It's actually to make things more simple. Because when a complaint is at the HPCSA, it's not being looked at by highly qualified lawyers and judges. You know, who, who sit in court. It's being looked at looked at by your peers, right? So. An explanation needs to show some sort of insight into the complaint from a clinical professional perspective, and it needs to be cool, calm, calculated, and, and, and you know, not, I've seen some, some, some doctors or dentists that try to write their own complaints, I mean, their own explanations to complaints, right? And what they end up doing is criticizing the patient and saying all sorts of, you know, getting defensive. It's human nature. When, when somebody complains, I mean, when my family member or my wife says something about me, I immediately want to get defensive, right? So I'm not blaming the practitioners, but we need to remove that element of, you know, it being personal. And that's where we at Dental Protection come in and where the lawyers who have this experience come in because they know what those committees are looking for. Um, so yeah, it just needs to be objective. Okay, Dr. Osman, I'm looking at the, the clock and I know that you mentioned there might be some load shedding on the hour. Are we all okay to continue? I think everyone's fine. Yeah, 
Um, if there were any questions from our colleagues on the webinar, if there's anything that that they want to ask us, just please type them into the Q&A function. So, yeah, Yash, talking about objectivity, I mean, I, I, what I do when I, when I'm asked to help a dentist who's got a complaint is I have to take the subjectivity and emotion out of the analysis of the complaint and I have to look very objectively at what the facts tell me, okay? And, you know, we, we, we know that we can't be brilliant every single day we treat patients and sometimes things happen where we're distracted in the practice. There's sometimes that we, we have very difficult patients who become more and more demanding. Um, sometimes we forget to do things, okay? But my, my job is not to side with anybody. My job is to find the correct strategy for the resolution of the complaint. And, and what I tend to do is I tend to look through all the facts. I look through the consent process and I say, well, was the consent process reasonable and was the patient given the type of information they need to make an informed choice? Um, once we get past that stage, we then start looking at, okay, so, so what treatment was agreed? What treatment was provided? Was it provided correctly? Were there any corners cut that have caused the problem? And then finally, we look at what the patient's complaining about. And, and, and many patients complain about recognized complications in healthcare. And, and, and we, we, we seem to run into a problem in dentistry because if you're a medical patient, if you're a medical patient and you have a surgical complication, you generally stay in hospital until the surgical complication is corrected and your medical aid will pay. But in dentistry, it's it's it it, it seems to be different in that the medical scheme uh, is unlikely to pay for the non-negligent complication, and the patients are unlikely to pay for the neg the non-negligent complication either. And it falls on the dentist to either put his hand in his pocket and pray pay for for free treatment to fix the problem or explain to the patient why they must continue to pay for this additional complication that's arisen and and the most obvious one that i deal with regularly is the fractured endodontic instrument and you know if you say to a patient after it's happened look look i'm sorry you asked this is a recognized complication of endodontic treatment if you've got anything about you you're going to say well alistair if it's a recognized complication you should have told me before we started here then i could have been better informed about what's likely to happen and the costs of taking that file out so you know i have so, so my role is to take the emotion out of, of of the analysis of the case and just look very coolly at the objective facts and then for me it's it's okay what is the aggregate of all the good points that we can use and the aggregate of all the not so good points that might trip us up if we decide to stand our ground and on that basis that's how we formulate a strategy yeah i mean Alistair, i mean tell me if you agree with me or not but i i would think one of the more difficult parts of your and my job is is to tell dentists and doctors what they need to hear sometimes and not what they want to hear because it's very easy for you to say well you've done nothing wrong and and the doctor will think wow i've got this support but actually you've got to be that objective uh, person that tells them what they need to hear and gives them a solution that will be in their best interest yeah because yeah, yeah. sometimes sometimes yash I, I can i can make myself very unpopular with dentists in south africa because of what i have to write to them i mean there, there is absolutely no point in saying look we've got endless sums of cash here to buy the best lawyers in the country to defend you when there's no defense you know it, it doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense for me to to expose a professional colleague to the public domain in a court where we know we know we've got the money to pay whatever it costs for to run a case to court but there's absolutely no point in throwing money at a case that we know we can't defend um, and and for me defense is as much saying to the patient you've done nothing wrong as it is actually saying to the dentist i think we can 
dispose of this matter if we agree to pay for that remedial treatment. That's a form of defence as well, and I think some people don't really get that. You know, that you you don't you, you don't go into war when most of the most of the missiles are aimed at you. Yeah, and the thing is, with these HPCSA complaints, I always try to remind the, the practitioners that if you're found guilty at a more formal process, that finding is published online. It's yeah. there for everybody to see forever. It will be a finding on your record. If you are, for example, thinking of moving overseas and you want to register with the GDC or something, they'll ask you, do you have any adverse findings against you? And so I always have to sort of go that, that far ahead to say, look, deal with it here at the ombudsman or mediation process where there'll be nothing on your record. Sometimes you have to make a compromise. You know? It's not about the money. You, you, your you, your rego- role in negotiating a, a kind of mediation corpus is slightly different because your job's not to advise the dentist and whether their treatment was good or not, and your job's not to tell the patient whether the the treatment was unsatisfactory i think what your job is if you get if you if you sense that something's not right clinically or consent wise that's why you would say to the dentist look before you make a decision on mediation here maybe you need to go and talk to the guys at dental protection or whoever they're with about the specific clinical or consent issues but you know your your job's slightly different you're just sort of negotiating a peaceful outcome here aren't you Yes, yeah, so Alistair, it's completely different to what you and Yash do. My, my job is to find a, a solution that's practical, uh, that's acceptable to the patient and the dentist, and try and find that as quick as possible. So I, I don't look at the evidence and, and vulnerabilities in the dentist's consent process and things like that. Uh, it's My service is a solution-focused service. And often, like we said earlier, uh, what the patient expects is not always what you think they expect. <laughs> and the trick, the trick of mediation is trying to find out what the patient expects and getting the, the dentist to understand why it's in his or her best interest to, to do that. <laughs> and then try and find a re- resolution and formalize that in an agreement and get the patient and the dentist to sign it. And, and sometimes that gets done in a day or two. You know, there are many benefits for, for the patient and the dentist if the complaint is handled through SODA instead of the HPCSA. Okay, so there's one or two things that are kind of takeaway points so people are really clear about this. But if I, if I have a complaint from Yash, he's my patient, I'm Yash's dentist, and he says that, Alistair, I want you to pay for retreatment, that root canal you did in my lower first molar was dreadful, and I'm still getting pain from the tooth. I can phone you up and say, Cobus, can you help me with this complaint? And you can say yes, but I can't tell you anything about who Yash is or about Yash's treatment because I'm protected by my duty to protect his confidentiality. And before before I could ever discuss clinical issues with you about my tr- treatment of Yash, I have to go to Yash and say, look, we've got a problem here. I know somebody who might be able to help us with this. Okay, is it okay if you if I contact the SADA mediator, Dr. Barnard, and tell him about your treatment? And if the patient says yes, then you've got permission to do that. If, the, if there's no permission from the patient, then it's impossible for me to tell you about Yash and his treatment. Would you agree? Yeah, well, like I said earlier, what mostly happens is uh, a dentist would discuss a complaint with me and then I would recommend that they refer their patient. Generally, I, I cover, a, cover a few options with them. You know, one would be to contact their indemnifier if they are a member. One would be to try and resolve the complaint themselves and or ignore it, uh, facing the, compli- the consequences. <laughs> and then one would be to refer them to the voluntary SADA mediation service and provide my details. And then generally within the same day or the next day, I would receive the, the complaint from the patient in writing with all the supporting evidence. And then the patient choose to, to um, work through the SADA mediator. 
I guess it's a little bit of a roll of the dice where the complaint ends up with with, with the HBCSA or SADA. If you if you Google um, dental complaint, you will probably have the two options available there. And um, yeah, so you're just lucky if your complaint comes to SADA instead of the HBCSA. And 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 again, just to be clear about what we can do, um, if, if a member of dental protection comes to us and says. Um, I've got a complaint. Can can you guys deal with it? That's what I pay my indemnity for. Well, well it is to a degree. We will we'll assist you. We will explain how you manage the complaint. But if the complaint's from Yash, um, as on behalf of dental protection, I cannot contact Yash and say, we represent Dr. Barnard, we're going to fix this, this complaint you've got with him. Um, we can't do that um, f for a bunch of reasons, but mostly because uh, of the confidentiality issues as well. And secondly, because as registered healthcare professionals, you're expected to be able to manage complaints yourself. But we can, you can contact us and say, I've got this complaint from Yash, how do you think I should handle it? And I'll say to you, this is how I think you should handle it. And if you're going to write a letter to Yash saying you're incredibly sorry, but you did nothing wrong, I will help you write the letter saying I'm incredibly sorry and I've done nothing wrong. But the letter must come from the dentist, not from the indemnifier or the insurer. It is different when the complaint is to the HPCSA and it is different when the patient is suing you and they want compensation through their attorneys. Okay, um, I'm looking at the Q&A function and there's there's still 184 folk listening to us, so that's good, um, but there's no, no further questions that have come up on the screen. Um, Dr. Osman, I don't know if you're still with us or not, um, and and whether there's anything you wanted to ask us on behalf of, of the YDC. I think you've covered almost everything in broad detail. And I would think that the young dentists starting out their careers need to understand that they should take the time to explain the procedure to the patient. By that, the patient will see that they're not young and inexperienced because there is the stigma that someone that's just starting out doesn't know everything. But if they take the time to communicate the procedure, the risks, that will go a long way in instilling confidence in the patient and also letting the patient understand what the risks are. That will limit the the, the risk of a complaint arising in the first place. I know dental protection does offer the risk-wise and all, all these excellent tools to help the young dentists and they can access that through your website and SADA as well we are there to guide them that is what our purpose is and that is what the young dentist council aims to provide is to be that network of support and peers that can help that have been through this before there is a mentorship program that is also up and coming soon SADA will then also form you form these special study clubs where we we would like to share our experiences. And as Dr. Naidu mentioned earlier, we don't make the same mistakes our predecessors have made before. So that is a great tool. And this can all be done through the YDC and SADA, along with the dental mediation service, before it even gets to the dental protection side of things. There are a lot of tools available from dental protection, the emotional support, the education articles, the PRISM educational format. These are all tools that the young dentists can use make sure that they do not arise or find themselves in these situations. I, I mean, I, I absolutely totally agree with you. I think, you know, dentistry is hard enough early on in your career, just managing all the clinical challenges. And then you've got, you can have some very difficult individuals attached to the teeth and the gums that you're working on. And, and, and it, 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 it can be a very stressful situation to know how to manage um, either an aggressive patient or an unhappy patient or a patient who's demanding that they want some money back from you. And, and I, I would always say, you know, it, 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 you can always do this, press the pause button and say, look, I'm really sorry you're unhappy about this. I'm not sure what the right solution here is. I'd like to get some professional advice before I confirm my position. That's all you need to say to your patients. 
say I've never been in this situation before. I'm not sure about the best way to, to move this forward. I'd like to get some professional advice and then I'll come back to you is, the, is probably the best way of buying yourself some time in a difficult situation. But, you know, we, none of us ever anticipate a difficult situation coming along and and most of the time it hits us when we're completely unprepared for it so it's one thing as telling you what you should do it's 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 even harder remembering and then putting it into place when 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 it actually happens so you know we 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 talk about complaints handling with the benefit of hindsight and you know it's you know, just like the cricket yesterday, Cobus, it was much easier to look at what England did wrong after they lost the test than if they'd won if they'd won the test. And it's the same thing in dentistry. It's much easier for us to to look back when we know something's gone wrong and, and actually point out where it happened and and hindsight's a wonderful thing that we don't have when we're actually treating the patients at the same at, at, at the start. So I get it completely. Nobody's ever going to be an expert, and that's why an organization like Dental Protection exists and that we're happy to help you deal with complaints. It's not just the HPCSA stuff that we do and it's not just the claims that we do. We're happy to help you with any matters arising out of your professional practice. So never feel that there's nowhere to ask help from. If it's out of scope, we'll tell you, but at least we'll redirect you. Uh, and there are times where we have to redirect members and sometimes it's to the mediation service, sometimes it's to Bunkash and, and Tunisia at SADA. But, you know, we will always do our very best to find some sort of assistance for you. So, um, I guess looking at the clock, we were meant to finish um, about eight o'clock. Uh, there's still a lot of people here, but there's no further questions. Dr. Osman, thank you for, for your contribution. Thank you for inviting us to be part of the Mentorship Week. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing as many of the YDC at the Cape Town Congress. I'll be there, Dr. Barnard will be there, and Dr. Naidu will be there. So um, looking forward to a good Congress. And if there are any other topics that you would like us to contribute to future mentorship weeks, then you only have to ask and we'll be very happy to make a contribution. Thank you, Dr. McKelvey. Uh, the reason my screen is off, my, my camera is off is because we've got load shedding, but I still have some time left on my laptop. I'd like to thank Dr. McKelvey, Dr. Naidu, Dr. Barnard. I'm gonna share the link to the mediation page for those who would like to see where to um, register a complaint and how to access the platform, right? You can see that this is on the SADA website. Uh, Dental Mediations is the uh, landing page. And then there is two buttons where you could actually be to register a complaint and access the platform. There are specific benefits for this. Um, so let's see if it does work. Um, how the process goes. The other thing, so you would have to basically just log in on your profile as an uh, activated profile, then it will take you to the... Dr. Osman, do the, does, the patient, does the patient... And this is a way that you can actually log in. The, does, does the patient... No, this is for the provider. This is for the provider. So if I'm a patient, what would the patient see and do? They would then have to contact uh, Dr. Barnard by via email. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, there's there's a phone number and an email address, Alistair. But most patients contact me by email, except those who wants to shout in someone's ear for half an hour. They they want to talk over the phone. Okay. Wonderful. Right. Um, and Yash, while we're on the topic of contacting Zara, contacting Dr. Barnard. If any of our dental colleagues wanted to contact MPS for some advice on our advice line, what, what would they do? Yeah, they can just Google Dental Protection South Africa, Medical Protection South Africa. And I think there's a toll free number on the website. Um, and there's also email address uh, details on the website. It's just a simple search. You should find us, yeah. Well, we do have a question. So McKelvey, but... yes, the... There's a question. Oh, 
Okay. Right. I mean, there there is a there, there is a question here, so um, I'll just quickly pick that one up. Dr. Osman, it says, hello, if you were to be sued, would your dental protection group cover you with that or would you have to get your own legal representation? I mean, the whole pur purpose of buying an indemnity from us is, is to protect you from the costs of your own legal representation. So um, we provide legal representation. If we have to pay compensation to a patient, that means paying compensation to the patient. It means paying the legal fees that we incur and we also have to pay the legal fees the patient has incurred as well. So um, that's the, the sort of peace of mind that comes with membership of dental protection is that if you're in a difficult situation like that, then the legal fees are covered and the compensation is paid. With the HPCSA, we, we instruct um, attorneys to gather together all your thoughts and instructions, the, turn, the attorneys uh, will prepare an a written explanation and they will submit that on your behalf. And again, the cost of that service is included in your indemnity. You don't have to pay any of the legal costs attached to representation before an HPCSA investigation, even if it's um, sort of low stress one like the chief mediator, we, we will instruct our, our attorneys to assist you with uh, an explanation to the, the chief mediator. Yeah, we didn't touch on it though that some of these HPCSA matters go on for years. I've seen some for more than more than a decade, so yeah, it can get. It's, it's not because we want them to go on for years. It's because sometimes the HPCSA are just a bit slow at putting together their case, and they're not able to get witnesses and they're not able to get experts. And it's it's very easy to 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 criticise the HPCSA, and the, they're not. I think we've got to be also very careful that they're not out there to get dentists and they're not out there uh, as prosecutors of public opinion against dentists they're there to regulate professions around the world and to do it as fairly as possible yeah oh, do we have another question yeah we do oh this is from that same person as dr anonymous what to do if a dental faculty does not agree to facilitate your expanded functions learning for oral hygiene as well as um, okay, so a very political question there. So, so uh, it's not one that um, that we would necessarily have an opinion on. I mean, we we are we are there to um, protect uh, not the profession uh, individuals, but the question is wh what should I do, and I'm paraphrasing, if a dental faculty does not agree to facilitate your expanded functions learning for oral hygiene? Yes. I'm not actually quite sure what the questionnaire means there. So it's, um, I'm, I'm assuming that it's, that you've been refused access to a facility for a training in your expanded functions. That's either that, or it's a scope issue where, um, the a training facility is not prepared to expand the scope of training. Um, Dr. Osman, maybe you can help me out here because I'm not sure because it's the HPCSA that set the scope of each profession. So I'm not quite sure what the, the question is about. From my understanding, um, oral hygienists that have qualified pre a certain year Yes. We needed to upgrade their skills to develop more skills. Yes. Skills. Unfortunately, if a dental faculty does not agree, there's not much we can do other than maybe the person gets in touch with oral hygienist association, see if there's sufficient numbers for them to facilitate this course. Because I know as the years have progressed, these courses have run, and the number of oral hygienists needing to do the expanded functions has decreased. And then probably it becomes a feasibility issue for the, okay. the dental faculty. Okay, so so I mean, what are there four four or five schools in in South Africa where that might train expanded duties? Sorry, I didn't get that. It was breaking up. Okay, so am am I right in thinking there are probably 
four or five training centers in South Africa for oral hygienists. Um, and I think what you're saying is that that from a feasi- financially feasibility issue, that some of those institutions are no longer running those courses. Is that what you're saying? That's my understanding, yes. Okay, so so I I I guess that 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 that's something that the Oral Hygienists Association of South Africa would need to pick up with the with the providers. It's not something that dental protection would do because this is more about training and and policy. It's not about um, our core business, which is protecting the reputations of our individual members if they run into problems with their clinical practice. Thank you, Dr. McElvey. I don't see any other questions. I'd like to remind all those that are still in the webinar, there will be a feedback form that will need to be completed as well. If all members would please take the time to just give us some feedback, any suggestions that you may want on speakers to present in the future, feedback on today's speakers, it is all welcomed and it all gets collated and we then try and deliver a better service to you, our membership. We look forward to welcoming each and every one of you to attend the Congress. Please do come out and engage and interact and network and learn from each other. And hopefully we can see you again at the next webinar. The next webinar is scheduled for Thursday. It will be advertised and the registration uh, would be online through your SADA portal. I don't think there's anything else. Any final words from each of our panelists, Dr. Naidu? Yeah, thanks a for having us, Dr. Osman. And um, I, I saw a lot of unfamiliar names in the attendees list. So I hope to see everyone in Cape Town at the Congress. Take care. Have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Barnard. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us on a on a Monday evening. I'm sure you have a lot of other things that you would rather do. And uh, yeah, I, you you chose a wonderful career, dentistry. You know, if I can turn back time 24 years, I would study dentistry again. It's it's a wonderful and a very rewarding career. And uh, yeah, just enjoy it and hope to see you at the Congress. Thank you. Dr. McKelvey? Absolutely the same from from me, Dr. Osman, um, but really on behalf of Dent Protection, just again, um, thank everybody for giving us an hour and a half of their time on a Monday evening. Um, look forward to seeing as many people in Cape Town as possible. And if you're not there, we'll catch up with you um, on another YDC webinar. It's always a great pleasure to um, give something back to the professional community. And if if our webinars just help just 1% to reduce the number of complaints or how you handle the complaint, then I think that we've made a positive contribution. So all that remains for me to do is to thank Yash and Kobus tonight for agreeing to join me and we'll see you next time. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And obviously, I'd like to take this time to uh, thank the team at head office, Maralise Seppo. Thank you very much for all the great work that you do and bringing this to our members. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone and have a good evening. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you, gentlemen and viewers. Our next webinars will be tomorrow and Wednesday evening.